titled this morning's message, Coronation of a King. A coronation is just, the word means an act or ceremony of crowning a king. And as Christians, we know that Jesus is the king, but Israel and the world really haven't recognized that yet. Uh, and, and mostly because they don't recognize the Bible as his word. And, I, and I'm talking about the nation of Israel even today. I know that they are God's people. He chose them. He created them out of Abraham. But as a nation, while there are Jewish people that are getting saved on a daily basis, um, as a nation themselves, they rejected Jesus as king. They rejected uh, Jesus as Messiah. And the world certainly, once again, doesn't recognize him as king. Amen. I, I've been talking to this guy at, the, at, this, at this gym in Homa. And one of the first times I talked to him, he, he called me he, he called me brother. And I thought that that was kind of funny. But I kind of like just waited around. And, you know, anyway, getting to talk to him, he's got a really awesome testimony uh, about the fact that his mom actually was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. He said, man, it really transformed our life. I mean, Whenever she got diagnosed with, with that cancer, all of a sudden she changed. I mean, we used to go to a different kind of where well, they went to the Catholic church. She started reading her Bible and she's like real studious. And he said, next thing you know, she's breaking down the book of the Leviticus to us and all of this kind of stuff. And he said, I tried to go back to the Catholic church after that. And he said they were praying to Mary. And I'm like, dude, I felt so uncomfortable. I'm like, I can't do this. And he got out of there. But the only reason I brought that up was, was because he made a comment. He said, you know, I like sports a lot. And I was telling my friends, but I never watch sports with the sound on. And he said, my friends are always asking me, why don't you? So I don't know who he hangs out with, but I'm just telling you, he loves talking about the Bible. And, uh, and he said, he said, you know, because they're so political. And he said, one time I was watching where Steph Curry was being interviewed after they had won the golden, you know, the, the championship in basketball. And I, I don't know a whole lot about basketball, but I do know that Steph Curry is like, probably the hottest basketball player next to LeBron James, if yeah. not more so. And that he did a deal with Under Armour, I think it is, for his shoes. And he's a he's a professing Christian. And in his Under Armour deal, he told them that he wanted on his shoes, I can do all things on the shoes. And they kind of like balked at him a little bit and told him, no, we're not going to. He said, well, that's fine. I'm going to go to Reebok and I'm going to take less money because I want that on the shoe. Oh, if not, God. the deal's off. And so they did They did the deal and they put it on there. Now, you see, there's a there's a Christian right there that don't really care what the world thinks about him. And uh, he stood strong. Well, anyway, after they had won, this woman was interviewing him and he was giving glory to God. He was talking about Jesus and all this stuff. And he said, I saw that woman roll her eyes. And he said, they hate the fact. That, they, that, they, that people want to talk about the Lord. And the world hates the fact that people want to talk about the Lord. I just brought that up as an illustration to show you. I'm just making a point. The world has not received. They have not allowed Jesus to be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Israel rejected him as their king. And I'm here to tell you, though, the fact that the book of Matthew focuses on the fact that Jesus is is king. Amen. And once again, the word of God explains it. It explains it throughout. It explains it in the Old Testament. It prophesied that there would be a king. And we're going to look at a lot of that this morning. And I realize that this morning's message really did turn into much more of a teaching. And I said this before. I told this when I went and preached at John's church. I'm, and I know I keep saying it, so please forgive me. I'm not going to apologize anymore for the way that it comes out, for the way that the Lord has called me to do it. Sometimes my teaching might be a little bit more preachy. I don't really know how this was going to turn out, but I do know that it's a teaching and it has a lot of scripture. So the book of Matthew focuses on the fact that Jesus is king. And in chapter one, I'm just going to kind of go through the book of Matthew real quick. And we're going to see where it leads us. Look at chapter one, verse six, Matthew one, verse six. It connects the genealogy of Jesus through David and Solomon. It says that Jesse, that's David's daddy, begat David, the king. And David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. So that's uh, the way the New Testament spells Uriah the Hittite. That was Bathsheba's husband. And so we see here that in the genealogy of Matthew chapter 1 verse 6, Jesus' genealogy is being connected back to Solomon. Look at Matthew 1 16. And Jacob begat Joseph the husband of Mary of whom was born Jesus who is called Christ. Now, this purposefully connects him, Jesus, to his rightful heir to the throne of Israel. Why? Because he was the firstborn in the house of Joseph and Mary. 
I don't know about you, but when I think of the scriptures, I think I, I, I turn over rocks because I'm like the first thing that I think of is, is wait, hold on a second. But Joseph, what is daddy? Well, you have to understand that according to the houses, houses of Israel, that the firstborn was connected to the father's rights. Now, if you go back to Luke's genealogy, he's looking more at the fact that Jesus was the son of man. He's looking more at the fact that Jesus was the son of man, whereas Matthew's focused on the fact that Jesus is the king. And if you look at Luke's genealogy, you find out that it, it's going according to Mary. All right. But but even in Mary, what we find out is that she was a child of David also, but she came from the lineage of Nathan, which was another one of David's sons. All right. And so. But as the firstborn in the house of Joseph and Mary, he was the rightful heir of Israel on the throne. Why, why do you say that? Because Joseph is a direct descendant of David, specifically through Solomon. Does that make sense? Solomon was the one who was given the throne. If you'll remember the story, whenever David was on his deathbed, uh, he was about to die. And one of his sons actually tried to take over the throne. And, and Bathsheba said, but Lord, you said that Solomon would have the throne. And David said in front of the prophet, it was God's will for Solomon to be on the throne. And so Solomon took the throne. And as a direct descendant of Solomon through the ages, this is where we are with Joseph. Now, you may wonder why. OK, so if Solomon, if Joseph is a direct descendant of Jesus, I'm sorry, of Solomon, then why is Joseph a carpenter and not a king? Well, you have to know some of the history of Israel, and we talk about this a lot, but there has not been a king sitting on the throne of from Judah since the Babylonian captivity. I believe his name, I'm shooting from the hip, was Jehoiakim. He's the one that they fettered him with brass and plucked out his eyes. The last thing that he saw before him was that his sons were killed. They plucked out his eyes and they brought him to Babylon. And that was the last king really that sat on the throne from the tribe of Judah. Now that doesn't mean that we know that the, that the word of God says the prophesied in, in second Samuel that the scepter will not depart from Judah. I'm sorry that, the, that there will always be a king on the throne of Judah and the fact of the matter is, is that Jesus is already resurrected. He's seated on the throne in heaven, but one day he will physically sit on the throne. Now, even currently at the time frame of Jesus, Rome is in charge. Y'all know that, right? Rome is in charge and out of spite, they have placed the Herods in charge. The Herods are actually the descendants of Esau rather than Jacob. Now, this is an interesting thing whenever you get when you start digging into this. And this is one of the I found something today, to be honest with you, that I personally had never seen before. And that's what excites me about the Bible. Amen. That's what that's why I try to draw you timelines. And I know I explain this a lot, but that's why I try to draw you timelines. I'm interested in genealogies, because if I didn't personally know some of these things, a lot of this would just completely go over my head. And I, and I hope that through repetition and through time that as these things are really deeply planted inside the inside of your heart as you read the scriptures for yourself you're going to be able to catch more and more of these connections amen so the herods are descendants of esau rather than jacob it's almost like they're throwing a fist in the face of israel saying you're in domination right because if you'll remember so rome is in charge but you'll remember the succession of kingdoms right the 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 the, the babylonian captivity then it went to the persian Captivity. Then it went to Greece, Alexander the Great. Now we're in the midst of Rome. Rome is in charge. So the world might not want to see that Jesus is king. But look, in chapter 2, we see the truth that you can't cover up and pretend play when God wants something exposed. Right. You can sit here on the throne, Herod, all you want to. And you can sit here and you can play around and you can try to and, and Rome can try to hide things. But all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the Magi come from the east to honor him who was to be the king of the Jews. And they went specifically to Jerusalem and they asked Herod where they could find him. Look at Matthew chapter 2 verse 2. <laughs> We're talking about the fact that Jesus is king. He says, they say, saying, where, this is the Magi talking. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Now, I just love this, this whole concept about this star 
I love the concept about the fact that magi, which really is a type of a word, we can call them wise men, but really the Bible is clear. They, they were astrologers, okay, from the east. That means that they were from probably the area of Babylon or Iran, Iraq or Iran, which is, is Persia. And these are the same kind of people that would have been in the time frame of Daniel. Now, we've talked about this before, and I've made this point to you before about Daniel's influence, I believe, because the word of God teaches us that Daniel was placed over all of these people way back during his time frame after he was deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now, one of the things that we know about Daniel is that he was a man of the word. He understood the word of God. He, God used him to, you, to, to provide great prophecies that explain to us end time events. The main point that I want to make to you about that, just real quick, is that Daniel had an influence. There's no doubt he had a huge influence on the Babylonian society and the Persian society where he was there because the king had elevated him after he interpreted that dream and he was over all of these wise men that were in that area. Not only that, whenever they tried to trip him up during the time frame of the new king, we, we talked about this recently, uh, they, they tried to trip him up by by uh, knowing that he was going to continue to pray to his God. And they wrote an edict specifically to mess him up. And if you think that the story about the man that God delivered out of the mouth of the lions did not continue on. Plus, King Nebuchadnezzar, the Bible teaches us, turned into a believer during the time frame while Daniel was still over there. And you know, all of this was directly related to Daniel. So all I'm trying to say is that Daniel would have had an influence on that area that region, both Babylon and Persia, whether these wise men come from Iran or Iraq, it doesn't matter because those two kingdoms were both in rule at one point in time during Daniel's life. All right. So he said, they say, where is he that is born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east. Now I want to take a look real quick and I want to make a connection between the star in the east, the king and Daniel. Now let's go back to Numbers 24, 17. So what I want you, what I want you to understand, and this is this is when we're doing time frames, and we're talking about Numbers 24, 17. Numbers, uh, what, what time frame is this? Who who's leading Israel at, during the book of Numbers? Anybody? Anybody remember that? Huh? No, Moses. Moses is leading. So. So the time frame is, this is pretty much around, this is during the exodus. This is after the exodus. This is during the wandering in the wilderness. And so what we're, what we're talking about here is somewhere around 1450 BC. Now, we're way over here in Matthew. This is probably about, I'm just guessing, about AD 50, all right, that it's written. But we're talking about the time frame of Jesus' life. Whenever all this is happening, so real time, we're going to say, you know, AD 30. And these numbers aren't right, but I'm not going to get into all that. I mean, the numbers aren't specifically right because historians kind of missed it by about four years. But so in the book of Numbers, you see the difference. So this is AD and this is BC. So we're really looking at close to 1,500 years, somewhere around 1,400 years of a difference. So this is a prophecy. Right. This is a prophecy that actually takes place. And so David, King David, and, and he matters because he is the seed of Judah from which Jesus came regarding the king. He's about 1000 BC. And so this time frame is about 400 years before this. All right. And so what you got to understand is, is that this is before David is even on the throne. And what the context of this story is, this has to do with, you remember the story of Balaam, the false prophet, and Balak, the king? I really saw something in here that was interesting to me. I hope I haven't already lost you this morning, because I know y'all are all just like really looking at me like, I can't tell whether you're with me, or if you're like, dude, this is way too deep for 9, 9.30 on a Sunday morning, all right? Did y'all drink y'all's coffee or whatever y'all need to stuff. Yeah, yeah. all right so so here we are numbers 24 17 the king of moab balak has heard that israel is on their way over there that they've already destroyed other nations and he is fearful all right so he's the king of moab and he's fearful and he hires a false prophet not named balaam you remember balaam was the one that the donkey had to talk to him because he was so hard-headed and he wanted now he now what you got to understand is that the bible also calls balaam a sorcerer 
So Balaam actually understood how to access the God of Israel. So he purposefully gets hired. And what he does is he offers up sacrifice and he tries to talk to the God of Israel. And what he's trying to do is, is that for this king, he's trying to get God to curse his own people. And what God keeps on telling them is, I'm not going to curse him. I'm going to bless him. And you need to go back and you need to tell King Balak what it is that I'm telling you. You need to tell that old ratchet king of Moab what's about to happen. I will not curse my people. But each time Balaam goes back because he's money hungry. A lot of preachers today tend to be money hungry. And they change the message. See there? But even Balaam, he couldn't, he couldn't change the message, but he kept trying he said, oh, okay, I'll go back one more time and I'll try again. And each time the Lord told him that he had to give a different message. This is one of the times whenever he's giving the message, he's returning back. And this is what he says. He says, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not near. So in other words, he's coming, but the time frame is not now. And it's not really close. There shall come a star out of Jacob. Now, when we talk about Jacob... Just don't, don't lose me here. When we talk about Jacob, we're talking over here. Jacob and what was his twin brother's name? Esau. Now this is about 2000 BC. Alright? So Balaam, the false prophet, is getting a word from God to talk to King Balak. But what he's doing is he's saying... A storm will rise out of Jacob. What is it? What is he really saying there? From the lineage of Jacob's seed, there's going to be a king that's going to rise and there's going to be a star connected to him. And so what he says is there's going to be a star out of Jacob and a scepter. That's talking about the king's staff shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheph. Now look at verse 18. I didn't have it in my phone. Because I, I wrote most of this message last night, and then this morning when I woke up and I read it, I noticed in, in this next verse, And Edom shall be a possession, Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies, and Israel shall do valiantly. Now this was what I got so excited about, and I don't know that you're going to get as excited about it as I did, but what I want you to know is this, is that Edom is another name for Esau. Alright? And that in this Numbers passage, once again, we have a king, Balak, who is the king of Moab. So this prophecy that Balaam, the false prophet, just gave, look at this. He says in verse 17, he says, A star shall rise out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel, shall smite the corners of Moab, destroy all the children of Sheph. Then he goes on and he talks about what he's going to do to Edom. All right. Now, when it talks about the children of Sheth right there, just bear with me. Okay, we're def definitely doing some teaching right here. You know what he's talking about? It's another way to say Seth. So now, at first, you get kind of confused. It's like, wait, wait, hold on a second. Why would God destroy the children of Seth whenever Seth was of the good line and Cain was the one that rebelled against God? But this is what we got to remember. Seth. Okay, this is this is where chronology comes in. Seth was even before Jacob, right? Seth was the son, the the, Seth, the third son of Adam and Eve. Cain had killed Abel. Here we have Seth, but guess what? Seth from Seth comes Jacob. Not only from Seth comes Jacob, but he also comes Esau. Not only does from Seth come Jacob and Esau, but also from Seth comes the Moabites. How, how did that happen? Does, does anybody remember how the Moabites came about? And you don't have to, I know this is yeah. Wednesday night, so you don't have to throw your, your paw up there and say it. But what I will tell you is this. The Moabites are one of those that came from Lot's daughters. They came from Lot. So in reality, what's going on here is, is that when it says they're going to destroy the children of Sheth or Seth, He's talking about specifically right here in this prophecy, Moab and Edom, the East, the, the, those that come from Esau. Now, let's back up a second because I've already mentioned it to you. This prophecy spoke to the, to the guy that was the king then, but it also spoke to Herod right there. And that's, when, that's what I got excited about because all of a sudden, if Herod knew anything about his past 
and his history and the scribes because he asked the scribes to begin to tell him what was going on. Where is this? Where is this king going to be born? Where is this? What does the scripture say about this Messiah? So he's not even a Jew. He comes from he comes from the Edomites. But what he realized is because what he's talking about, we have seen his star in the east. The only passage in the whole entire Bible that talks about a king star connected to Israel coming from Jacob has to do with this passage that we just saw right here in Numbers 24. So what that means is when Balaam prophesied on that day, I believe this with all my heart. When Balaam prophesied on that day, he said the sons of Sheth specifically connected to the descendants of Moab, you King Balak, and the descendants of Edom through the years that they are going to be smited and Herod being from Esau sitting on this throne a counterfeit would have also gotten the message that he his kingdom wasn't going to last either right and so they both descend from Seth though but neither one of them come from Jacob Jacob was the one that God had chosen he comes from Abraham and it was from Jacob that came Judah and from Judah ultimately came David and from David was the lineage of Jesus. And so they, I, said, I saw more clarity in that Numbers 24 passage. So once again, how does that Numbers 24 passage connect back to Daniel? Because Daniel would have known Numbers. Daniel would have known the word of God. He carried that verse of scripture in his heart with him as a young teenage boy when they brought him from Jerusalem to Babylon and tried to lock him up and tried to change him and try to cause him to go according to the ways of the world. And what he said, I believe with all my heart, I can't give you a scripture that says, and Daniel taught the astrologers about the star that would rise out of Jacob. I can't find a scripture that tells you that. But you tell me a better way for the Magi of the East. To know that there was a star that was going to be connected to the king of Israel. And that they're going to travel all the way over there. And they're going to come looking for the king that would bo that make the, the, the child that would be born king of the Jews. Mm -hmm. And so here we hear this prophecy. I'm not going to, I'm not going to get off of this because I'm excited about it. I know this isn't a shouting message, but I'm telling you right now. To know that Balaam, the false prophet, prophesied mm -hmm. and told the king then, Balak, that his kingdom was going to be destroyed and that that prophecy continued to live through the ages and rested also upon that Herod that was sitting on the throne who was a descendant of Esau, that his kingdom would also be destroyed. And all of that coming out of Numbers 24 shows you the eternal nature of God, right. shows you the fact that the word of God is quick, meaning alive and powerful and sharper than a two-edged yes. sword. God's word doesn't die, amen. It lives on forever and ever and it continues to effect change. Now to hear all this that's when Herod asked the scribes where is the Christ going to be born and this is their response they quote Matthew quotes Micah 5 2 because this is what they told him look at back Micah chapter 5 verse 2 he says but thou <coughs> but thou Bethlehem Ephratah Though you be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Now, I'm, I'm completely shooting from the hip here because I did not go back and look specifically at the time frame of Micah, but I'm imagining in my mind it's somewhere around 500 B.C. or maybe a little bit sooner than that. All right. And so now we have another time frame, even after David. This is a prophet that is after David. But we're going back. We're seeing through the ages that the Old Testament is telling us that there's a king coming. And one of the things like I've talked to you before about how God progressively revealed to us the seed and the sacrifice. Right. Regarding the plan of redemption. You remember how we talked about that? We also see how God progressively is honing in. And revealing to mankind exactly who his king would be, right? First, we're hearing that he was from Jacob. And here we hear that he would be born out of Judah. But even more specifically, that he would come from Bethlehem. All right. Matthew chapter 2, verse 11. Here's just another example. And I know we've talked about it. But where of Jesus as king. Because whenever the Magi or the wise men showed up. And finally found Jesus. 
Now, you do know that, and I'm sure you do, but just so we're all clear here, Jesus wasn't a little baby in the manger whenever the Magi actually showed up. I mean, I know that they're, they're a cool part of our nativity, you know, and we don't want to, like, really take them out because the nativity looks real cool with the three wise men giving their gifts. But really and truly, Jesus would have been more like a toddler by the time they actually showed up, all right? And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense and myrrh. And we talk a lot about myrrh because myrrh was used to embalm dead bodies. And I've always made the point that even in his birth, we see the, we see the, the plan of God in the crucifixion. It was already, it's already being spelled out for us. Frankincense is directly connected to the role of the priest. Jesus, as our great high priest, he ever liveth to make intercession for us. He's seated at the right end of the Father, and he's making intercession for us. But the gold speaks of his royalty. It speaks of his kingship. Now, look, the world might not want to know that Jesus, might not want to recognize the fact that Jesus is king. But the, even, the, even the wise men from the east, they knew it. And look, the world might not want to see it, but in chapter 4, Satan knows he's a king. Look at this right here. He attempts, he tries to tempt him with the kingdoms of the world. Y'all remember that story. The enemy of our soul will tempt us. Now, now I'm trying to make this a little bit more about our lives right here when I make this comment. Like how it affects us, I guess is what I'm saying. The enemy of our soul will tempt us at both the level of our needs and our desires. When I say needs, we have to be reminded that as the last Adam this is, I know I've said a lot of words already, but just kind of just let's slow down a little bit. And I want you to kind of follow my thinking here. All right. Jesus as the last Adam. Do you know what that means? Whenever Paul says that. Mm -hmm. he, it, 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 one of the concepts is this, is that Jesus came to make right what Adam made wrong. Whenever the Bible calls Jesus the son of man, it's talking about the ministry of Jesus to make right what Adam made wrong. What I'm trying to tell you is this, is that Jesus purposefully limited him. I don't know how you're going to feel about this, but that's why I'm going slow. So you hear me real clearly. Jesus purposefully limited himself on earth in his ministry. What are you talking about? Because he didn't act as God. Jesus's purpose on earth is not to act as God. Jesus' whole purpose to be on the earth is to make right what the first Adam made wrong. Jesus' whole purpose to being born is to die on the cross and to fulfill the plan of the Father. Now, I've said this before, but Kenneth Wiest, the Greek scholar, says this. Jesus never lost possession of his deity, but he willingly laid aside the expression of his deity. What does that mean? Jesus did not act as God on earth. Jesus acted as a vessel through whom the Holy Spirit moved and operated. And that's how those miracles were performed. Jesus did not, did not resist temptation as God. Whenever he's facing Satan, he's resisting temptation as, a, as the man Christ Jesus. But this is the difference. He doesn't have a sinful nature. He doesn't have a sinful nature like you and I do because he's not born of Adam like you and I are. Adam was, was created without sin, but he didn't have the divine aspect of him either. And he failed God. And therefore, here, you know, here we are. But Jesus was in the form of God, according to Philippians 2, but he became man. So when we look at the needs of man, that's what I'm trying to say. I, I said all that to make this point. The needs of Jesus are different than the needs of man because of the fact that our needs are going to be tainted with our sinful nature. Right. Or our needs or our desires anyway. Let's put it that way. The desires of man who comes from Adam. Does that make sense? Are tainted by sin. Right? All right, so let's look at the needs first. I'm trying to tell you that the enemy, because when I just saw this right here for our personal lives, the enemy is affecting Jesus. He's tempting him at the level of his needs, and he's also tempting him at the level of his desires, all right? 
Uh, so let's look at needs first. Food and safety. You remember that? I mean, we're not going to go back to the passage, but whenever Satan is tempting Jesus, what does he tell him? Jesus is fasting and he says, turn these stones into bread. Right? That's a need. Because, I mean, Jesus is a man. I mean, you never saw the God of Israel eat. I'm talking about the Father. You never saw him. He never slept. Yet Jesus ate and slept. Jesus was a man. And he has needs. His physical body will only go so long without food. And so the tempter comes and says, turn these stones into bread. That's a basic need that humanity has, right? And, and, okay, and then the next thing is this having to do with safety. I mean, for you and I, I know that there's teenagers and stuff that go live on the streets of Seattle to make a point. Like, we want to be here. There's so many kids that live on the streets of Seattle, and if they interview them, they tell them that they purposefully went over there because this is how they choose to live their lives. But let me tell you something. Reality is, most people don't want to live like that. And I, they don't want to live like that either. Most of them are running from something that's even worse. That's a crying shame when it's better to sleep on a street with a needle in your arm than it is to live in the house that you were raised in with your parents, okay? But my point is this, is that when it comes to needs, when it comes to food and safety, most of us want to know we have a roof over our head. I'm making it real simple right now, but what I'm trying to tell you is this. There's a lot of things in our lives that you and I don't know how it's going to get fixed. There's a lot of things in our lives that we go through and we don't know how exactly we're going to make it through. And what the enemy is trying to get Jesus to do is to go in opposition towards trusting the Father and instead to, to act as God, which was not his not the Father's will right here. The Father's will right here was for Jesus to, to make right what the first Adam made wrong and to resist temptation, amen, as the last Adam. And what the enemy is trying to get him to do is to pick up his power and to make something happen or to get God to do something in opposition to what God would want done. And there's a part of man that wants to know that he's going to be taken care of. And we can, we can all put on our tough face, but the truth is that we want to make sure that our next meal is taken care of and that no bodily harm comes to us. You know, when you use David as an example, then I'm just going to use David as an example of this. He was a king of a kingdom. All right. You, can you imagine the stress that that man must have been under? I mean, like, if, in other words, if he's trying to think of it in his own strength, he, Saul was trying to kill him before he became king. Absalom tried to kill him and to take over his kingdom. His own son, after he became king, he had enemies all around him. I mean, we think we got some stress in our lives. I'm just trying to say, if we try to think back of the, the, the pressure that the king of Israel, David himself, must have endured enemies at every side, right? But this is the thing that I thought about. God's the one that promised that David would sit on the throne. God's the one that promised that he, that he would give David the kingdom. And so in reality, it's, David, it's God's responsibility to make sure it happens. It's David's responsibility to trust God that it does. Let's look at Psalm chapter 144, verses 1 through 2. And I'm just trying to make a point. David has a, has a need for safety. And look what he says. Blessed be the Lord, my strength, which teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight. I like that. He, David gives God glory for everything. You know, some of us want to take a little bit of glory for ourselves, you know. And we know that God did this, but, oh, well, you know, I'm pretty good at this. You know, no, no. David said, my hands, even my fingers, the way they move, he's probably going back maybe all the way to Goliath. I don't know. You know, even the way that I held that sling in my hand, the Lord taught my fingers and my hands to war. Praise God. Amen. Yeah. Uh, my goodness and my fortress. You, you ever thought of a fort, right? I mean, a, great, a fort can help somebody hold off. A large, a pretty large army. Like if it's a strong enough fort, you can face a large enough one. My high tower, a high tower represents the fact that he's out of harm's way, right? But look at this. He is my deliverer and my shield. A shield talks about hand-to-hand -hand combat. So it doesn't matter if the danger is far away or up close. The truth is, is that David knows that God is his deliverer. No matter how many enemies he has, no matter what their plan is, the truth be told that unless God moves his hand out the way, David is taken care of and he's safe 
and his needs are taken care of. What happens to Jesus when he is tempted is an example of how Jesus had to trust the Father in the midst of his trial. What's happening here is relevant for God's people of all times. I know we're talking about Jesus as king, and that's what I'm teaching you on. But guess what? Sometimes we, we also need to stop and we need to realize that God cares about our individual lives. He cares about every moment and every detail, and he cares about the things that we're going through. And God's people are faced with circumstances and situations that they don't know exactly how God will make a way. And every time this happens, I'm telling you, you can plan. You, you, if you stop and think about this for the rest of the day, you will be able to see what the enemy has done this in your life too. Every time you're faced with a situation that you don't know how God is going to make a way, the enemy is going to offer another way. Abraham, for Abraham there was an Ishmael. What, what does that mean? God promised Abraham that he would give him a seed and that through that seed, all nations of the earth will be blessed. We know that the right that the seed was Isaac because the word of God tells us and through Isaac came ultimately Jacob and through ja you get the point Jacob came David David came Jesus but God but Abraham I'm sorry attempted in his own strength to bring about the plan of God he made a choice to lie with Hagar the Egyptian bond slave and produced Ishmael a work of his own strength a work of his own flesh Instead of trusting God regarding Isaac. For Jacob, there was the deception of his father. <clears throat> you remember that? Whenever God, the promise was that Jacob, at their birth, the promise was that Jacob, not Esau, would be God's anointed one. But yet, when times became desperate, what does Jacob do? He puts some fur on his arm because Isaac couldn't see anymore. And he tries to gain through trickery and deception what God had already promised would be his. And here for King Jesus is a chance for lordship over a kingdom. And all he has to do is to bow down in opposition to the will of his God. That's what Satan's asking him to do. Bow down in opposition. All right. And so that's the needs part, you know, uh, the, 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 it, well, I'm now I'm transitioning to the desires when it, when it comes to the kingdom, I'm transitioning to the desires because listen, it is Jesus's desire to do the will of the father. And I'm about to make that point in a second. Right. And, and the will of the father is that Jesus would be the king. <clears throat> and so Jesus has a desire to be the king because that's God's will. But the enemy is trying to get Jesus to go about obtaining that will from a different method than what the father would have had him to do. All right. And it almost goes without saying that the Lord's desires, we've already said that, are different in that he did not have a sinful nature. Look at John chapter four, verse 34. This is the point that I was making that Jesus's will is to do the will of the father. Jesus says unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Do you, do you remember what this, this context is right here? I love this story. This is Jesus with the Samaritan woman. Y'all remember that story? The Bible says that they were on their way to Galilee and in order to get to Galilee from Judea, you had to either go through Jerusalem, either to go through Samaria or you could cross over the Jordan and, and bypass it. A lot of Jews would do that because they hated Samaritans. But the Bible says that the Holy Spirit, well, it doesn't say that. It says he must needs go through Samaria. In other words, he was compelled to do it. Many times whenever you're compelled to do something that you don't understand why, it's because the Holy Spirit is doing that. He's telling you to go that way, right? And so Jesus goes through Samaria, and the Bible says that his disciples went off to go get some food because they were hungry. And Jesus instead goes to this well of Jacob, uh, that this, this well that Jacob had dug back in his day. And there the Samaritan woman comes to him. Now, we're not going to get into all the details, but he has this long discourse with this woman, this Samaritan woman. And we know if you've read the story, there's a whole lot there. But at the end of it, his disciples come back with the food. And they say, well, they basically ask him, aren't you hungry? He said, my meat is to do my father's Praise will. Now. My meat is to do my father's will. And look at this. And to finish his work. 
So the desire of Jesus is to do the Father's will and to finish his work. It was the Father's will for him to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But before the crown comes to the cross and Satan tries the same tricks on Jesus that he did on Abraham and Jacob. Look what it says. Matthew 4 verse 8. <clears throat> Again, the devil takes him up into an exceedingly high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he tells him, all you got to do is bow down to me. And so my question for you today regarding needs and regarding desires is what are you facing today? What is the enemy offering with regards to fixing it yourself or out of fear, trying to get you to make a decision that is outside of God's will? And if it isn't happening to you now, it will happen to you at some point in time before this life is over. And sometimes it's happening when you don't even realize. Yeah. In each and every situation and circumstance, when an opportunity is presented before you, all I recommend that you, that you and me do is that we need to, to imagine in our mind what is going on here. What really would be God's will here? Is this is the way that I'm about to make this decision? Is this really of the Lord or is this of the flesh? Because there's a lot of times that there's things that we're trying to do and we even do it in the name of the Lord. And in reality, it's not the spirit of God that's promoting it. Instead, it's our flesh. All right. So it says right here, chapter five, he addresses. Uh, so in chapter five, <clears throat> we're talking about the king still. We talked about chapter one is genealogy, where he came from. Chapter two, the Magi said he was king. Chapter four, uh, Satan knew he was king. Chapter five, Jesus addresses the citizens of his kingdom. And he explains how his kingdom looks different than what man is used to kingdoms looking like. And you know, when we have to turn to the passages, I'm just going to tell you, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Remember that? That's completely contrary to the world's way of thinking. You're supposed to be humble, not haughty. The, the world's way of thinking is, I want to elevate self. Jesus is saying the citizens of my kingdom are poor in spirit. They, they see themselves in a right light. They see themselves like David saw. It's the Lord that makes my hand and fingers know how to fight. Whenever you begin to give glory to God, you begin to realize that it's not me and what I have done, but instead it's the Lord in me. It kind of like helps cut through some of that pride. It helps cut through some of that way of thinking that is really not of the Lord. Have you ever seen people or had conversations with people that they don't do anything but talk about all their skill and, 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 and all their gifts that they have, you know, and they go on and on and on about it or how good looking they are. I've actually had people tell me, yeah, pe people think that, you know, whatever, that I'm good looking or people, you know, tell me that I'm, that I'm all this and I'm thinking to myself, man, I'm done with this, bro. I need to move on. And I mean, you get on my nerves, bro. I don't even hear all that, right? So, that's the first thing. Humble, not haughty. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Number two, blessed are they that mourn. God desires for his people to mourn over what he mourns over. Listen, the world celebrates sin, whereas God mourns over the results of it. The Bible says Jesus wept. Remember when Lazarus died? I've preached this to you multiple times, but let me make this comment real quick. Why do you think Jesus was weeping? It was, let me just ask you this. Was it because his friend died? No. It, I mean, it just wouldn't make any sense, would it? Because he, what did Jesus know? He's going to bring him back to life. Yeah. I, amen. I believe that. Because of what the result of sin on the human race. The Bible says that they were all mourning around him. They didn't believe that he could bring him back. Yeah. Well, they didn't even really know at this point in time really what his plan was. All they knew was that his friend, their friend was dead. And they love their friend. And there is a time for mourning. Don't misunderstand me. But what Jesus wept over was the effect of sin on the human race. The fact that it causes death. The fact that it causes pain. Amen. And what I'm, what I'm here to tell you is, is this. Is that God mourns over sin. God mourns over the effect of sin. And the citizens of his kingdom are supposed to mourn over the effects of sin also. The next thing he said, and I'm not using all of them, I'm just using four. Blessed are the meek. I put down here, meek isn't weak. Meek is like restrained power. You remember whenever Jesus said this? He said, whenever they came to get him in the garden, did you not know that I could call a legion of my father's angels? I love that passage of scripture in John. As a matter of fact, whenever they came up to him and he was turning, 
He, he could sense them behind him. He said, whom do you seek? We seek Jesus of Nazareth. The Bible, if you read it in the, in the translation, the Bible says that he responded and said, I am he, but that's not true. If you read it in King James, the he is in italics. That means that the translators put it there. What he said was, I am. And when he said, I am, they all fell to the ground. And in another spot, he talks about the fact, did you not know that I could call a legion of my father's angels? I've often thought about the fact that when he was on the cross and the world's passing him by and they're laughing at him and they're ridiculing him. And whenever the religious leaders say, he said he was going to save the world, he can rebuild the temple. He can't even save himself. Look at him stuck up there on the cross. And I was thinking to myself, boy, what restrained power to not call down the legion of angels right then. That's the meekness. Not, the, not having the necessity. I feel like I need some more meekness in my life. Because even though I don't try to go around talking to people about how good looking I might think I am, sometimes I don't think I'm as meek as what I should be. All right? And what I mean by that is this. Is that, you know, you, there, there's something to not always having to prove what you think you can do. Yeah. Right? But instead, to let, once again, to let the Lord get the glory mm -hmm. in the midst of our life. To not think, you know, the Bible just says, don't think more highly of yourselves than what you ought to. He goes on to say this, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Kind of sound, sounds like it goes well with what he said in John 4, right? My meat, my food is to do my father's will. Jesus was hungry for something. He was hungry to do the Father's will. In the, in the, for the citizens of his kingdom, what he's saying is this. You're supposed to be hungry and thirsty for the righteousness of God. Man is going to hunger and thirst after something. Will he be driven by his hunger and thirst for the things that the temporary physical world offers him? Or will he be driven by the Spirit of God to do the will of God? Jesus. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. So... I'm always talking to you about context. I really just built the context that Jesus is the king. I know that I didn't have to convince you of that, but internally within the book of Matthew, that's what it's teaching us. But I also want to get into this chapter 12 real quick. I think I could do this in seven minutes. All right. Before we get to the parables of chapter 13, which will start next week. Chapter 12 seems to really be <clears throat> a changing point. Something happens in chapter 12. That changes the way that Jesus teaches. He begins to speak in parables in chapter 13. Whereas before he was speaking more plainly. Like even the Sermon on the Mount right there. What he said was. This is what the citizens of my kingdom look like. You might not understand it right now. But I'm just here to tell you. This is God's plan. And he's not changing his mind. He said a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Remember when he talked about that? You are the light of the world. Now, they may not have understood exactly what he was saying. But it wasn't in veiled language, whereas parables are, are something, there's a mystery behind them that have, they have to be interpreted. Before, before chapter 12, Jesus wasn't teaching in the book of Matthew in parables. So what is it that happened in chapter 12? Well, before we can understand the parables of 13, we need to understand the conflict of chapter 12. The Pharisees made, made a big no-no right here. They made a big boo-boo, if you will. Jesus had authenticated his power through the miracles that he had performed. However, as the crowds grew, so did the opposition against the religious leaders of Israel. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, mostly the Pharisees are the ones that Jesus is having interaction with, right? Uh, they, they, and what they concluded in chapter 12 was this, was that Jesus was operating under another power source. Not the power source of God, but they said he works under the power of Beelzebub. Which is basically saying his power is coming from the devil. Now, this is, some, this is some serious stuff right here. Let's look at Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 through 23. If you've ever personally wondered what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. Now listen, when it's all said and done, you might have heard somebody say something else and that's okay. And it probably was somebody that was a whole lot smarter than me and that's okay too. And if you choose... When it's all said and done, to kind of lean towards what that person said, I'm fine with that also. I'm just telling you what I found from the text and what I believe to be blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 through 23. 
Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, inasmuch as the blind and dumb both spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is, is not this the son of David? But the response of the Pharisees was, He doesn't work by the power of God. He works by the power of Beelzebub. All right. So, I, I, and I pre gave you this because I wanted you to see what I believe blasphemy of the Holy Spirit was. I didn't think I should pass this up, even though this wasn't directly related to where I was going with this. All right, look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. So this right here is specifically regarding what I believe to be blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 12, 28. This is Jesus' response to them. He says, but if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. You say I cast out devils by the devil, and he talked about how the devil was divided, would be dividing himself and, and, and all this kind of stuff. But then he says, but if I cast out devils by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So he introduces where his power is coming from. He's saying, no, the power that I'm exhibiting here is actually coming from the spirit of God. And the kingdom of God is now you're beginning to see the kingdom of God manifest upon the earth. Now, let's look at three verses later what he says. After he introduces the power of the Spirit of God, this is what he says. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Who did he just say he was, work, who was, work in through, was working through him? Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Whosoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaks against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now, you can do what you want with that, but to me, this is becoming real clear what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. It's when you attribute the work of God to the power of Satan. Now, what I'm trying to tell you is that Pharisees weren't believers. And basically what Jesus is saying is you just blasphemed against the power of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> what I, so what I, want you, what I want you to know is this. That's why I'm somewhat careful when I, I there's a lot of times that I've called preachers and said that, I didn't, that they weren't preaching the truth. But there's been some times that I've actually said, I believe that preacher's working for the devil. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not just, I'm, just, I'm not going to sit here and tell you about all the YouTube videos that I've watched and the countless hours that I've studied to do all of this stuff. But there is enough, I have seen enough evidence to believe that there is a portion of the Protestant church that we call the church that people standing behind pulpits that are saying that they're Christian leaders and in reality they know that they're working for the devil. I believe that to be the truth. And I have actually said some of their names before. I'm not, but I'm not going to tell you that I haven't said, Lord, if I'm wrong on this, please forgive me. Because I'm not trying to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. But what I'm saying is, is that I believe that some of the work of some of these preachers are purposely operating under the power of the enemy. And they are not operating under the power of the Holy Spirit. And that there are a lot of preachers who mean well, that have learned from them, that are not doing the exact same thing. But they're still preaching error-filled doctrine and it still results in bondage. All right. So that's what I just wanted to show you. When you attribute the work of the Holy Spirit and say that it's the work of Satan, I believe that that is truly blaspheming the Holy Spirit. It's not like, I don't know if you saw these videos where these young girls were getting on the thing. Some dude that was some Satanist was trying to get these teenagers to get on TV and they YouTube themselves and they say, I say that I renounce God and I'm right now blaspheming the Holy Spirit. That's not blaspheming the Holy Spirit. That's just you being stupid and following after somebody else and saying some stupid stuff. And hopefully the Lord's going to convict your heart. And one day you'll fall to your knees and you'll say, Jesus, I'm sorry that I ever said that about the Holy Spirit. Right. Uh, so anyway, that's what the word blasphemy means. It means to slander, to, to make a false accusation. All right. So let's take a little, look, a little bit of a closer look to this conflict that seems to have caused Jesus to change his style of teaching. Now, I was going to read it. It, it. You can go back and read it later if you want, but we're not going to read it for sake of time because I only got two minutes. No, I'm just messing with you. Uh, but it's in verses 1 through 14 of, John, of Matthew chapter 12. It starts with a conflict. And look, to the neck and eye, I got to tell you, it looks like Jesus is the one picking this fight. And I got to tell you, I mean, that's probably not the right way to say it because, once again, Jesus is much more meek than the way my mind works. 
But in a way, Jesus is kind of the one that's causing this trouble. If you really stop and you look at it, so you can say people, and I don't believe this, but people would say Jesus was the ultimate rebel, right? That during the hippie days of the 60s, Jesus was never rebellious. He was he did rebel against the world. He rebelled against the, 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 the framework and the institution of religion that was on the earth because they were wrong and God was right. But, but we see this repeated behavior in Jesus time and again. And so what, what I want you to see here is this, that one of the first conflicts has to do with it was a Sabbath day. And his disciples were walking through the fields. And I can just imagine they grabbed the head of grain and they, they, they were ripping the grain off and they, and they, they were eating. They were hungry. And so what the Pharisees saw them doing on the Sabbath was to them, it was like they were working and harvesting. This, this is how serious the Sabbath day was. It had to be a situation where you had to prepare in advance for the Sabbath. And if you was going to get some grain, you should have gotten that on, on the day before the Sabbath and prepared your food to where you didn't have to do the work on the day of the Sabbath because the Sabbath was a rest day. And so here they are, they're walking through the field and they're peeling off the grain because they're hungry. The disciples say, why do your disciples not respect the Sabbath? And Jesus says, Jesus says to them, he, he says, do you not remember what David did? Now we just really cut, we were about to cover this Wednesday night. Remember whenever David got the, the sword of Goliath from the, from the Himalek, the high priest? Remember that? Amen. Well, guess what? He, his men were also hungry. And so the, uh, him like the priest said, all the bread we have here is the, is the consecrated bread for the show bread. And, they, and, and David said, that's fine, we'll eat that. And Jesus said, do you not remember what, he, what David did when they were hungry? And essentially what Jesus ends up telling them is, the, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Because what we understand is that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was, not, was, made, was made for man. Man wasn't made for the Sabbath. Okay, then there's another spot in that same verse that he heals a man on the Sabbath, right? So this is just happening back to back. And he said, and this, but this, he had a withered hand. Remember that? The man had a withered hand and Jesus healed him and, and made him whole. And the Pharisees get mad about that. But look, if you go back and you study Jesus, he's always doing stuff on the Sabbath. That's right. It, he healed the blind. He healed that man, that lame man at the pool of Bethesda in the book of John on the Sabbath. And then what did he tell him? Pick up your bed and walk. And I mean, I don't know. I wasn't there to, to understand. But it was by the it was. I'm pretty sure it was near the temple. And so Jesus didn't tell him to leave it there. He told him to pick it up and walk. And so wherever he walks, he walks right in front of the Pharisees. They see this man walking with his bed and they, they accuse him of breaking the Sabbath, which means to bear a burden. And so the next thing you know, now they're, they're mad at Jesus because he said he told him to do it. <clears throat> they don't care about the fact that Jesus just performed a miracle and healed a man's withered hand and, and healed a man that was lame for 38 years. No, they just know that he broke their rule. There's another spot in the book of John too where he heals the blind man. And you remember that one? He picks up some dirt from the ground, he spits in it, and then he does his number here and he makes a paste and he puts it on their eyes. That would have broken one of their laws they created. I've told you all about that before. It was called kneading. It was like kneading. Like you need dough or you need clay. That was bearing. A, they considered that bearing a burden. This is the crazy thing. Jesus didn't have to make that clay. He didn't have, all he had to do was speak. Jesus healed the centurion's daughter. And he wasn't even over at the house. He said, go home. She's going to be okay. No, he did that on purpose. He needed that clay to break their stupid little Sabbath. And he put that stuff on that man's eyes on purpose to conflict with their false doctrine, to conflict with the way he, Jesus is over here causing this thing to happen. Now, he opposes their religion. There's no question in my mind that that's exactly what he's doing. So my, my next question is, why does he oppose their religion? We'll look at Luke chapter 4, verses 17 through 21. We need to read that. Jesus sat down in the synagogue and they handed him the book of Isaiah. 
And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now, one of the things you got to understand is this. Jesus came into the midst of a world that was filled with darkness. And unfortunately, the light of God had shone on the Israel nation. But the religious leaders of Israel during the time frame that Jesus came, instead of allowing the light of God to be illuminated, had completely changed the word of God. And the result of their changes to the word of God and the result of their misinterpretation of the law of God had resulted in the people being blind, bound, and chained up. And what God's saying is, I have come to set them that are a captive at liberty because that is what the truth of the gospel does in people's lives is it sets them free whereas religion, false doctrine binds them up and blinds them. Amen. Real quick, two of the things that happens, the withered hand and then the man that Jesus rebuked that, dump, that, that spirit out of him and they accused him of doing the, working through the power of Beelzebub. I want you to know that I realize and believe with all of my heart that God still heals today just like he did back then. I believe that. I know that there was a reason that Jesus performed these miracles and it was specifically to reveal to them that he was the Messiah, that he had come. But God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that natural circumstances, he, he goes past all of that. And I know that he physically heals today. Many times, and he can heal you. Amen. If you got a sickness or an illness in your body, he can heal you. Praise God. However, as a teacher of the word, I cannot help but come to the realization that every time Jesus heals somebody, there is undoubtedly a spiritual message in the midst of all of that that's going on. He's trying. He's making an illustration. He's he's healing and he's teaching. He's healing and he's teaching. He does a miracle and he teaches. Right. So first he heals the man with a withered hand on the Sabbath. The word withered in medicine nowadays, we call that contracted or atrophy. Basically, it was all dry. The word means dried up of all of its natural juices. For a layman like you, like the rest of us, whenever we're not practicing medicine, basically it means it just didn't work. It was stuck. It wasn't doing him no good. His hand didn't work and he couldn't work. Right. I think about that when I think of hands, because the Bible oftentimes connects work to hands. The hand of man connects to his work. He couldn't do the work of God. So so they listen, they accuse him over and over of breaking the Sabbath. Jesus heals the man. But what I want you to know is this, is that he couldn't do the work. He couldn't work because of his shortcomings. But guess what? <clears throat> For you and I today. When it comes to the work of God, would you not agree that many times people are hindered by what they perceive to be their shortcomings? I'm not necessarily talking about a withered hand. I'm talking about something that they feel like they're inadequate. I don't know how many times we got to talk about the fact that Gideon thought he was inadequate. How many times we talked about the fact that so many people feel as though they're inadequate. But yet at the same time, God, hallelujah, has come to set us free. So that we could do the will of God. The next thing he does is, is that he says, and in, 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 we already read it. If I cast out devils by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I've gone way over seven minutes. Mm -hmm. And I know that y'all, I hope y'all are still with me. Yes. I'm going to try to, to, to do this the best that I can and, and not turn this into another 30 minutes. All right. <laughs> but listen, <clears throat> Jesus bound this strong man. And what I've known that I've taught this before, but uh, he said, how can you spoil the goods of a house until you first bind the strong man? Now, the illustration may seem a little funny, 
But basically what he's saying is you can't just walk off in Troy's house. I'm just using Troy as an example. He, it may not be the right context, but he may not have a gun. He may. I don't want to know if he does. That's his business. But he's allowed to have a gun. But if he doesn't have a gun, he might have a baseball bat. Toy might not even know it. He might have it hidden up under the bed. I don't know. But my point is, is that if you break into Troy's house and he has a baseball bat and you weren't aware of that fact and he clocks you upside the head, you're going to wish that you would not have gone into his house to try to spoil or take his goods. So if you're really going to try to go in Troy's house and take his stuff, you need to first bind him. Like, you know, I don't know, hit him on the head with the baseball bat, put him in the chair, and maybe wrap some duct tape around him and, and definitely stick a sock in his mouth so he can't holler for Toya because if she wakes up, dude, it's going to be all. Right? But, but, so, but this is the point that I'm trying to make. That's what he's talking about, binding the strong man of the house. He's talking about this world. Jesus came to bind the strong man of this world so that the work of the kingdom could be yes. done. Now, the way that he bound the strong man of this world was through the work that he did on the cross. We've already talked about that. Colossians 2, 14 and 15. We said that we've used that scripture at least three for three weeks in a row. How he spoiled principalities and powers, how he defeated and triumphed over the powers of darkness through the cross. We but that's really how he gave it to us, because Jesus right here, this is before the cross and he's got the power over the devil. Right. So whenever you look at these scriptures together, what, what you begin to see is this, is that through the binding of the strong man and the healing of the withered hand, you see Jesus giving deliverance to his citizens so that they can go forward and do the work of the kingdom. Now, he said in all power in Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19. All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Therefore, go into all the world and, and make disciples of all men. Right? Preach the gospel to the whole world and make disciples of all men. Now, I'm closing with these two verses of scripture. And you, you can turn there if you want, but I'm going to kind of move a little bit quick. Romans 5.21 and then Romans 6, 5 through 6. Romans 5.21 says that as sin reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm talking about a withered hand or the work of God being able to be done. And I'm talking about a strong man being bound. Jesus already had the power to do those things before he ever went to the cross. But what Paul's writing about right here in the book of Romans is the effect of the cross and our faith in that and the spiritual change that has taken place in our lives and how it's affected us. And what he's saying in Romans 5.21 is, is that before you were converted, before you put your faith in Christ and what he did for you at the cross, sin was the king in your life. It was ruling and reigning in your life. It had you in bondage. It dominated its power over you and prevented you from being able to do what it is that you should have been able to do. But now, through the righteousness of God given unto you through Jesus and what he did for you at the cross, grace can reign unto eternal life. Now grace is the king of your life. Amen. Freeing you, liberating you to be able to do the work of God. Look at Romans chapter 6 verses 5 through 6. This is a more specifically how it happened. He says, we have been, for if indeed is basically what he's saying. We have been planted together in the likeness of his death. What Paul's saying is, you and I became one with Jesus. When we put faith in Christ and what he did for us at the cross, we became one with him. It is death and we also should be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man, the old man born of Adam, bound with sin, in bondage, has been crucified with him so that the body of sin, that the power of sin might be destroyed, that from this day moving forward, we should not have to serve sin because sin is not our king. And now our hand is no longer withered. And now we can go forth and do the work of God. During this time frame, and I'm closing with this, known as the church age, God has liberated his people, the citizens of his kingdom. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and he has liberated his people in order to do his work.